Welcome to the USFA podcast, the official podcast of the U.S. Fire Administration. I'm your host, Teresa Neal. Before we jump into this episode, I want to invite you to join the conversation about fire safety. Please email your questions, stories, or podcast ideas to FEMA-USFAPodcast at FEMA.DHS.gov. Please reach out. We'd like to know what topics or interviews you are most interested in. Okay, on this episode, we're discussing firefighter physicals and the new provider's guide to firefighter medical evaluations. Firefighters are at increased risk for several types of cancer, on-duty cardiovascular events, sleep disorders, as well as behavioral health concerns such as depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. Every firefighter needs to take control of their own health care and ensure their providers are aware of the physical and mental health stress common for firefighters. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force provides recommendations for exams and screenings for the general population. And while these are good as a baseline, they're not designed for an occupational group with increased risk, like firefighting. To help you make your provider aware of the risk, the First Responder Center for Excellence, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, International Association of Firefighters, National Volunteer Fire Council, and the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation designed the Provider's Guide to Firefighter Medical Evaluations. On this episode, we'll be joined by Dr. Sarah Janke, Director and Senior Scientist with the Center for Fire, Rescue, and EMS Health Research at the National Development and Research Institutes and also Todd LeDuc of Lifespan Wellness, who worked on this project. Okay, so thank you, Todd and Sarah, for being on this episode with us. You're going to talk to us about how this Healthcare Providers Guide started. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I I really think, I also appreciate um, being brought on to talk about this because I think it's such an amazing resource that people are not necessarily aware of. And what we kept hearing is that people would take these things, you know, they would go talk to their doctor and they'd be like, oh, I'm a firefighter. And the doctor would be like, yeah, okay, and? Because they operate off the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, you know, that that's what dictates billing and those types of things. And often they're not looking for for even for symptoms that are beyond, you know, you hear a symptom and, and it's a cough or something like that, general population, probably nothing. Firefighters slightly more likely to have some of these diseases, whether it be, you know, cancer or any, you know, a, a, actually a pretty wide variety of um, impacts. And so it's really to just raise the awareness of this is a risk factor that I face. Similar to like, you know, they ask your smoking status. That's because if you're a smoker, they consider things differently. They, they, they add different things to the list of differentials. And so we did, the first one was awesome. We took it out, put it in the hands of a lot of primary care docs, and we got a lot of feedback that was love it, but. And so when we looked at the what's, what, what are the buts, they tended to be things like we have, you know, so 20 minutes is generous. Often it's five to seven minutes with someone. So they said, we really can't, two pages is, is too much. And it was a struggle because, you know, when we did the brainstorm, we were like, oh, we want to, you know, we want to give everyone a book. No one, no primary care doc is going to read a book. <laughs> uh, and so they said, you know, it has to be shorter. It has to be front and back. But then there was also a subset that said, I'd really love to learn more about this. So could you expand it? So I'm like, okay, so we're gonna shut, we're gonna cut it back to a post-it note, but we're gonna expand it to, <laughs> to a dictionary. Got it. Uh, uh, totally on it. Um, it's, it's, the other thing that we got feedback on that was interesting, both from firefighters and from primary care docs, is you know, don't tell us like you have to do this because for some people it's not appropriate, mm-hmm. and for some people even with that risk factor they would do screenings differently, and so there was some some concern around that. Um, and, and there were some things that said, we already know this. If, we, if this is what we do in a general, you know, our initial one was this is comprehensive, you know, mm-hmm. annual medical with your um, annual physical with your primary care provider. They said, if we're already going to do it, then don't, you know, don't, don't tell us to do it. So the revised version took into account a lot of that feedback, all that feedback, and looked at how can we provide more resources and more information on less, with less real estate. And so we cut back quite a bit in terms of, Words are very succinct. It's now like bullet points, this, Mm -hmm. this, this, and this. So that was one of the big changes that from the last time. The other one is we now have resources online for those who are like, oh gosh, I'd really like to know more about that. So we have like a dermatologist that's recorded. So there's now a QR code and a um, website, a web address that they can go to and get that information and say, oh, okay, now I get it. This is, you know, this is what Dr. Candler, um, who's been working with a lot of firefighters up in the Northeast in particular, Here's why, what she says to look for and how we should be monitoring this. Or um, this is what Denise Smith says about this topic. So that part, I think, is helpful. The other thing is we changed it from do this to consider this. Mm-hmm. And because it gives room for the providers to say, here's, you know, this is not what we want to do right now. And this is, you know, and this is 
why? Because there, some firefighters were going in and going, I have to have all of this. And the docs are like, no, because there is a challenge with the screening piece, right? You don't want to screen all people for all things all the time because there are sometimes implications and negative. If you, if you over screen, the cost is bigger than the benefit. Mm-hmm. And so, but it's really more for awareness raising. It's not, there was like 17 days of disagreement on whether this is an NFPA light. And it's not, it's not asking, it's not designed for a primary care doc to release you for duty. Mm -hmm. It's, this is designed for even for people that are getting department physicals to be able to go to their doctor and say, Hey, because those doc med providers are not your physician. They're Mm -hmm. the department physician clearing you for duty. And they're clear on that role. What we found is the fire service is not clear on that role. You know, firefighters are like, Oh yeah, I saw, I saw a doctor but it's not your doctor. So mm-hmm. if you need, you know, your blood pressure monitored or, you know, your whatever is out of whack, that primary care doc, unless it excludes you from duty, you're either good to go or you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to make sure that people are tying into primary care physicians who get to know them, who understand what they do, those types of things. So. Mm-hmm. So you talked, I heard you mention um, Dr. Smith and her research she's done on cardiovascular. So can you talk about some better heart cardiac screening recommendations for the firefighters? Thank you. 
Totally agree. <laughs> I don't have anything to add what, to what Todd just said. No, I, I, and it's, that's what I think is awesome right now about like where we're at is, and you know, this is going to be 2.0, but there's going to be 3.0 because we're quickly learning, you know, with, we're looking um, pretty aggressively at like screenings and, and what, and, and, you know, this is outside of what the U S preventative services task force recommends, which is some of the pushback we've had from providers. But at the same time, I think that's, those are designed for general population. And so then the question is, you know, and also we need to be consistent with messaging um, that's going on in the fire service so people can take to their providers. Hey, here's what I'm hearing. What does that mean for me type stuff? So there are a couple departments that are like doing amazing things where they're going to their primary or they're going to their insurance companies that the department has. And they're saying, Hey, we want our firefighters to get screened for these things. Let's negotiate that. Um, insurance companies are developing a separate code for a firefighter physical and they do that. Um, so there's like, I see progress, so much progress. It's such an exciting time to be in this field because there's so much progress on what's happening and what can happen and what should happen. Um, so there'll be a 3.0. I I have no doubt about that, that this is going to be evolving. Yeah. I was going to ask, how do they get around some of these insurance blocks where we we don't screen for that because you're not the age or we don't screen for that, you know, for whatever reason and how they get the insurance companies to approve it and uh, move it forward. So that's one thing that, uh, you know, so some departments have done it where they've just taken it head on, hey, for our insurance. I know Denver did that and they some of the insurance companies there. I know there have been, and I think that's one conversation that we need to be facilitating for people who've been successful because they think it's an awesome idea. Um, the other way is that a lot of times physicians will ask about symptoms of things that they wouldn't necessarily be looking for. And once they ask, then, you know, they, you often can get that reimbursed if you're having symptoms, but so often we just don't even know what the symptoms mm-hmm. are. So, Hey, are you having symptoms of X, Y, or Z? Okay. Then let's go ahead and get you screened for that. And then that's covered by, and I'm not saying that like, and it's a way to trick the system, but we're not just, you know, in general, the providers like, Hey, you, you good, you, you know, your blood looks good. This looks good. And so many things, I mean, that's what we see with cancer and the difference with early detection. Um, you know, people just don't know what the signs and symptoms are, you know? And, and, and so when they look for him, then they're like, Oh, got it. Got it. And it's probably advantageous in the long run for the insurance company. Cause if you get it early, it's not the, right. the, the expense is right. not the same as if it's later on. Yeah. So you said there would probably be, or there will be, a 3.0, 4.0. So what are the next steps? What are the ones that you're looking at now? Um, I, I think following the data that we have that about around screenings is one specifically that, that'll be big and what should be screened and what shouldn't. I think we'll get some feedback from the primary care docs on what they did or didn't like on this. You know, one of the things that was interesting that I found most interesting is, you know, we're giving this about like, here's the physical concerns. Almost to the um, primary care doc, they said that what they really liked about it was the having behavioral health listed, mental health listed on the page because they said it gives me permission to bring it up. Um, And so I think that probably looking at how can we, you know, is it just bringing it up on the page or do they want some sort of screening, something like that. But I still can see that being an area of growth. I think we're seeing some work in the reproductive health and we're really actually we're working with um, FRCE and uh, to design like a version for OBGYNs. What do you need Mm -hmm. to be aware of? We're seeing documentation of fertility issues in both men and women. What should we tell someone who either a firefighter is trying to get pregnant or and either th- that woman is the firefighter or her husband's a firefighter because we're seeing fertility issues in men. 
Um, and then once a woman is pregnant, then what? And we're seeing with that, uh, we're already seeing some like increased risks of miscarriage and preterm labor. So what does that mean? What are the implications and what are the job tasks? You know, like when you talk to a firefighter and they want to be on the truck and you say, what do you do? They say they drive, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, well, drive on pump fires and do it, put it on it, you know, but it's, and I get it. I get it. And there are a lot of like complications in terms of um, when people go offline or go on light duty or But we, you know, I think as we learn more about that, um, I know Jeff Burgess and his team are doing a lot of work and we're helping him out on some of it, but I got to give him the credit for being the the mastermind looking at AMH and women. And and we know that um, being in the fire service, he's measuring and will be measuring um, people pre and post fire exposure and looking at women pre and post fire exposure in recruit school and, and looking at the basically being in the fire service ages your reproductive health faster than, um, than if you were just, you know, doing my job sitting behind a desk. Yeah, I was going to say, are, so. are you focusing on women? Because I, I know um, for myself, um, years ago, I had breast cancer. Nobody in my family had ever had breast cancer. And we didn't understand why I, you know, at that time, we were still thinking that it was something that your mother has or somebody in your aunt. No one mm-hmm. in either side of my family had it. And so I was doing some research and, and don't, it, I mean, I don't want to get bad letters, but, you know, I, there was a thing that said women who served in the military are 25% more likely to have breast cancer than women who did not serve in the military. That might not be absolutely true, but that's what I read. And so I wasn't in a, in a job that was, uh, you know, I, around nuclear or radiation or things like that. But it's just the different way that you used your body at that time, I, I suppose. I don't know. But now it's something that anytime one of my friends from my military days, I, you know, I tell them, like, you know, get screened, get screened. Because I was 42. You know, it wasn't a time frame when I really thought that cancer was going to be, you know, an issue in my life. And so I know we're getting it younger and younger. And, and there's all different types of reasons. I'm not saying my time in the military had anything to do with it because I love my time in the military. But but right, it is a right. consideration. And, and a lot of, the, you know, like, because there's also been the other side of it. People are like, oh my gosh, are we pushing people out of the fire service because we, that, you know, because they're going to be scared, they're going to be whatever. I, I think, I understand where that's coming from. I think there's so much that we can do to mitigate it. Mm-hmm. And like, was your time in the military tied to it? I don't know. We'd have to look at their original studies and see, you know, what that link was. And are likely you were exposed to things that you didn't realize at the time. I mean, and everything from like shift work has now been classified as a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Like, even some of those like behavioral envi- and environmental pieces, like those mm-hmm. can play an often significant role in the, how cancer develops in people. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that it was, but I'm also not saying it wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, that's an empirical question. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. So is there anything else you would like to discuss or tell me about this tool that is now available? How can they find it if they don't know about it? It's currently on the, I believe it's on the First Responder Center of Excellence website. The other website that it's on is our Science Alliance website. And so it's um, www.science-alliance.org. And we have that up. It's a um, network that we're building to really facilitate conversations between the scientists and the people who actually need the information (laughs) because the science on on the science side of stuff have not been great at that. So I know that's there under resources um, and you can click on provider's guide and it has both the provider's guide that you can print and that's where the QR code goes to all the references and the list of people who reviewed it and the videos and all those types of things. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. Thanks so much for amplifying this work because I think it's, I, it's very important. I, I do think, oh, it's, and it just has to be, we have to hit this on all fronts. You know, if we really want to make an impact, it's not, there's no one and done. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it, but, but it takes partnership. It takes this, it takes you going, Hey, we need to talk about this and get it out there and get it out on a podcast to make it happen. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thank you for listening to the USFA podcast. And thank you to Dr. Sarah Janke and Todd LaDuke for joining us today. Remember, if your department has medical evaluations to clear you for duty, that's great. However, occupational medicine and department exams are focused on clearing you for duty for your department. Your primary care provider is focused on managing your health. So help them understand your special risk. As mentioned in the beginning of the episode, you can join the conversation about fire safety by emailing your questions and sharing your stories to fema-usfapodcast at fema.dhs.gov. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple or Google and share new episodes every third Thursday of each month. You can visit us at usfa.fema.gov or on social media by searching US Fire. Until next month, stay safe.